Good day, Eve and I. Good to be with you guys again. Let's um, let's pray. Almighty God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land, you are God, and we worship you. Help us to worship you now as we keep listening to you speak in your word. Please shape our hearts and our minds as you would have them be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight I want to talk to you about uh, one of the most fundamental and critical issues that there is in life. Whether people, us, whether we are basically good or basically bad. Are we basically good or are we basically bad at heart? Not are we capable of doing good things or capable of doing bad things. We all know that we're capable of both. But fundamentally, deep down, if you scratched away at us and got right down to the heart of it, what are we? Uh, And what I want to do is start by getting you guys chatting about it. I I want you to talk about it together. And so um, take 20 seconds. What do you reckon? Are we basically good or basically bad? Chat to the person next to you. Oh, natural lull. Okay. You solved it. Was that enough time? All right, job done. Uh, I'm not going to ask for your thoughts. If we had time, I'd love to do that, but time doesn't permit. Um, I reckon broadly as a culture, not, not us here as a church, but broadly, more broadly as a culture with the media, the politicians, the uni professors, the actors who, you know, I reckon we're confused. I reckon we hear lots of different messages that are contradicting at different points and We've, we're not really sure. Let me give you some of that. Let me give you some of the, the messages that I think we hear. Uh, on the one hand, there are some who have an assumption that people are so fundamentally good that we should be able to let people just choose whatever they want to do in life, be whatever they want to be, pursue whatever they want to pursue, and that would be great. And underneath that is the assumption that fundamentally we are good. And so anything we choose, that's totally fine. That same group of people, though, would also promote a kind of cancel culture where if you do cross a particular line, you're gone. You're, you're the devil, you're evil, uh, there's no forgiveness for you. You should cut that person out of your, their, your life. They should be fired from their job and we should forget they ever existed. Uh, There are some who would tell us that uh, all the people in the past were ignorant, wicked, racist, environmentally irresponsible colonialists, and yet somehow now, us people in the future, here or in the present, we're all good. We've figured it out. We're the enlightened ones. We've become compassionate. We get things now, and now we're good. People back then bad, people now good. Another position would say that humanity In our hearts we are good, the reason we do bad things is uh, societal structures. Uh, These things around us, the systems that are put in place, the systems are corrupt and they curve us toward doing bad things, but it's not our fault, it's theirs. And so the aim is to tear down the institutions, deconstruct. But then another voice hears that position and says, no, it's not that, it's the human heart. Put me in any structure, any society, and I'll find a way to be wicked. And so which is it? Who's right? What's the correct diagnosis of the human heart? And let me frame the question more sharply and more critically. What does God think of us? When God looks at us, does he think that we're fundamentally good or fundamentally bad? Now, this is a massively important question. 
And your position on it will shape so much of your life. It'll shape the things you pursue, what you do. It'll shape your eternity. And here's why. One day, each of us are going to have to stand before God and give an account for our lives. And so if God looks at us and he sees a bunch of people who are fundamentally good, sweet, just get on with your life. Do whatever you want, really, because you're good. And so, yeah, sure, you'll, you'll come before God, but he looks at you, he thinks, yeah, you're fine, it's all good. And so pursue whatever you want to pursue. You know, pr- try and be a good person, sure, but you know, you're fundamentally good, so you don't have to try that hard, it's all good. But if that's not the case, if God, the God of heaven, looks down at us and sees people who are fundamentally not good before him, then what's life about? It's radically different than that first vision. What life's about is getting right with God so that when I do front up before Him and have to give an account, I'll be okay. Finding a way to come back to Him. And so what is the answer? Are we good? Are we good in God's eyes? Jonah 3 tonight has got the answers for us. Because in Jonah 3, what we see is how God responds to the worst of the worst, just worst guys going around, the Ninevites. How does God respond to them? What does God think of them? But we're also going to see, as we see that this is actually a message spoken initially to Israel, who were supposed to be the best of the best. If anyone was good, it should have been them. We're also going to see that Israel were in a dire position before God too. And so I've kind of let the answer slip already. But what we're going to do tonight is dive into Jonah 3 and hear the diagnosis of, of what, where we stand before God. But the beautiful thing about this chapter is it also has the cure for us. And so let's do that. Let's dive in. Chapter 3, I hope you've got Jonah uh, open up for you there, before you. Chapter 3 picks up uh, with a freshly vomited up Jonah. Like Boba Fett climbing out of the Sarlacc pit, Jonah sits on the sand contemplating his life choices Uh, and he's just experienced an amazing, um, uh, the mercy of God. He's been rescued from drowning and so Jonah is now a new man. Chapter 3 comes off the back of this long psalm-like prayer that Jonah's prayed inside the belly Uh, and Jonah 3 is where we see this turning point for Jonah where he actually gets on with the thing that he should have done right from verse 2, chapter 1. So, chapter 3, verse 1, Jonah hears from God once more, and God says the same thing to him. Have a look, chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you, just like God said to him at the start. And, And so, here's Jonah doing what he should have done from the beginning, In chapter 1, verse 3, God came and he said that to Jonah, and Jonah got up and he ran away as far as he could from the Lord. But here, chapter 3, verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. And so he heads off, he obeys, he does what he should have done. Having experienced the mercy of God, he gets up and he's on with it. Halfway through verse 3, pick it up there. He obeys the word of the Lord, he goes to Nineveh, And now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. And you've got to imagine there that those three days going through Nineveh was a little bit more pleasant than being in a stinky fish belly. And so he's he's in the city and he starts his ministry and it's a massive success. Verse 4, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. In just five Hebrew words, Nineveh repents. They hear this message from this Israelite prophet from ages away and we have this scene of extraordinary repentance. Verse 5, the Ninevites, they hear this word from this backwash, backwater, stinky, 
whale belly prophet and they believe God. They hear this as God's words to them, verse 5. They believe God and this fast is proclaimed. They, these, these pagans, these idol worshippers, these people who are brutal and far from the living God, they fast, they stop eating so that they can pray and call out to God. They put on sackcloth, which is like this coarse, uh, rough goat hair sacks, think like a potato sack, which is this symbol of grief. It's what you might do at a, at a funeral. And it's, if, it's as if they're saying, we're as good as dead. We do not deserve, we, we're going to be destroyed and we deserve it. It's this scene of massive repentance and it, it happens across the entire city from the greatest to the least and it even reaches the king. Pick it up there in verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. And this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. I think we're meant to be struck here by the king's response. This is deep and genuine repentance. And he wants the entire city, which is, we're told later, 120,000 people, he wants all the people to repent, even the animals, even dress your animals in sackcloth. Let's grieve together, let's call out to God together. There's even this owning of the fact that they have been wicked and evil. See that in verse 8 there? Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. He knows they've been wicked. He knows they've been violent. And there's this genuine humility in it all. Verse 9, he, said, he recognizes that they actually deserve this. See, there's, there's no presumption here. Verse 9, who knows? God may yet relent. Not relent, God, because look, I've done all these good things now, but who knows? We have been evil and wicked. God may perhaps relent and turn from his fierce anger. There's no presumption here by the king. The repentance is deep and genuine. And God was rightly angry with them. It says, you know, Jonah's message, God was ready to wipe them out. And we know, the Bible tells us again and again, as Israel dealt with Assyria, uh, the, kind of, the, the bigger country that Nineveh was the capital, the, the Assyrians were wicked and a few more decades later, and the Assyrians actually would come and smash Israel. But we know from outside the Bible of their violence. Uh, they, were, they were a people who were constantly at war. If you, ch- you just chase it up on the internet, you see the, there's these pictures of uh, depictions of the Assyrians dismembering their enemies and, and putting them on poles and cutting off their heads. And they were a brutal and violent people, sadistic and God was ready to wipe them out. And yet Jonah comes in, and in our retelling of the events, he speaks five words in the original language, and they repent, they believe God. And what we find again outside the Bible is there's actually this this period in Assyria's history which lines up with the time of Jonah where Assyria stopped going to war. Year on year, they, they went out campaigning, waging war against their neighbours, and then suddenly their campaigning just dries up and they seem to let go of their violence. Now, how could such a wicked people turn like this with such speed and depth and sincerity, with so few words preached to them? Well, only by the incredible power of God a huge working of God's Spirit. Only God could bring about such a huge turning in a whole group of people like this. God's the power behind Jonah's success. But the power of God, I think, is is secondary here in this passage to God's compassion. It's actually God's compassion on these wicked Ninevites, which is the thing that's on view, that God would forgive such a wicked people. Have a look at verse 9 again. Who knows, 
God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Such is God's compassion that he would turn from punishing even people as wicked and violent as this. He would look on them with genuine compassion, wicked and evil people. This is, God is, this is not like um, modern day people, the cancel culture thing. You stuffed up, get out of here. We never want to see you again. God's not like that. God looks at people who've done the wrong thing and even has compassion on them. Have you stuffed up before God? Have you done the wrong thing? Do you carry guilt? Do you know that God, you've done things that God would look at and disapprove of? God is a God of compassion. And at the repentance of these wicked Ninevites, he relents. He looks on them with favor, with grace, and he turns them around. God's a God of compassion. We need to know that ourselves. And so we can learn from the Ninevites. We can turn unpresumptuously to God, humbly before him saying, I have sinned, I have been wicked, and know that he's a gracious God. Now you think that Jonah would be ecstatic at all this, right? Jonah's kind of, he's turned his life around, he's out of the whale, he, well, the, the fish, he's, um, he's experienced the mercy of God himself, he's been saved, and now he's had this massively successful ministry. How good that there's 300 people here, but there were 120,000 people there. You'd think he'd be cheering. Uh, but have a look at how he responds. But to Jonah, chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 1, Four verse one. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, "Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity." Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah is not stoked. When, where God turned from his anger at the Ninevites, Jonah now stews in his. His anger is aroused. Where Jonah once, at, in the belly of the fish, praised God for saving him from death, now he prays for death. Something's going on for Jonah and God will go on in chapter 4 to rebuke him for this and I trust that uh, this coming week in growth group, in church next week, we're going to wrestle more with this but for now, what I want us to consider is, what is the view of humanity here in Jonah chapter 3? Given what we've seen of the Ninevites, given what we've seen of Jonah, what are we to make of humanity? Are we basically good people whom God is pleased with? Or are we sinners, deserving our entire city to be overthrown? Well, straight up, it's safe to say that Nineveh are a very extreme example. There are people so wicked, God was ready that in 40 days' time, I'm giving you 40 days, but in 40 days, I'm going to destroy this city completely. 120,000 people gone. Such was the wickedness of Nineveh. So they're, they're kind of an extreme example now, could it be right for God to do this, little aside? Could it be right for God to overthrow a city? I reckon it doesn't take much reflection on the, the previous century, the 20th century, to understand that this could be right. The slaughter of the Jews under Nazi Germany, the millions killed in communist China under Mao, the millions who are intentionally starved under Stalin in Soviet Russia, the Ninevites, the brutal, wicked Ninevites who would dismember and impale and behead their defeated foes. Now, the real question is, how could God have compassion on them? That's the real question. That's what's truly amazing. Okay, so humanity. We've got Nineveh. We know they're really bad. But what about the rest of us? 
What does God think of the rest of humanity who haven't done all the wicked, evil things that the Ninevites have? I think the answer is found in recognising that this is a message to Israel. This book was not written for the Ninevites to remind them of what they did. This book was originally written for Israel. Israel were the readers of this. It was their enemy repenting before their eyes in this book. And so, what are we to learn of Israel? Well, Israel should have been the best of the best. Uh, They were God's special people, the ones God had shown incredible love to. He'd set his affection on them. He'd rescued them out of slavery in the land of Egypt. He'd given them land that they didn't work themselves. He'd given them his good laws that were beautiful laws, that if they obeyed them, life would have been beautiful and all the nations in the world would have looked to them as this people of wisdom and righteousness and goodness. And and so Israel were meant to be the shining example of humanity. Those who loved God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, their strength. They would love their neighbours as themselves. And so of all the people in the world, Israel should have been the good ones. But what's God saying to Israel here in Jonah chapter 3? As he puts before them Jonah, their prophet. As he puts before them the Ninevites and the Ninevites' repentance. What's God saying to Israel? Well, here's where we need to go a bit Sherlock Holmes on this passage. Before Benedict Cucumber Man was Dr. Strange, I can't say his last name, uh, he was Sherlock Holmes. And so what I want us to do is to have another go digging deep at this passage and put on our little Sherlock investigator hats and ask some some penetrating questions of this passage. So are you ready to, to go deep again? You ready for that? Take deep breath if you need to. Let's start with the big picture. This book was written for Israel. And of all the characters in the book so far, who are the ones who've responded rightly to God? It's not Jonah, it's not Israel's prophet. It's the Ninevites, it's their enemy. And so what might God be saying to Israel, showing them the Ninevites? He's saying, look, These guys are the ones who are responding rightly. The most wicked of all people, your enemies, they're the ones who are responding to my words rightly. Now, what does that tell you about what's going on for Israel? Israel were in a bad way. First of all, you've got Jonah himself. Of all the people, the prophet should have been the light to the blind, should have been the one who was following and obeying God, and yet... Israel's prophet, the best of the best, is running away from God. His heart is far from God. But what happens when you look at the historical context of Jonah, of when this was written, is you find out that Israel were in a deeply bad way. Let me tell you some of the historical context behind Jonah. There's another part of the Bible, 2 Kings chapter 14. And in 2 Kings chapter 14, we find out that that's when Jonah was preaching. That's when he was going around doing his ministry. And in 2 Kings 14, Israel had been led into the sin of King Jeroboam II. Whoa! Now, what's the the sin of King Jeroboam II? It's the same sin as King Jeroboam I. Mind blown? Well, what's the sin of King Jeroboam I? Well, you go back in Kings, further back, you get to 1 Kings chapter 12. Is that right? And 1 Kings chapter 12 tells us that King Jeroboam I led Israel into worshipping idols, golden calves. So Israel, at the time of King Jeroboam I, at the time of King Jeroboam II, at the time of Jonah, were worshipping, bowing down to golden statues of calves. Now, does that ring any bells for you? 
Israel bowing down to golden calves. When else in Israel's history did they bow down to golden calves? At Mount Sinai in Exodus 32, which, ready, we're going full Sherlock right now. Exodus 32 is the passage which is directly quoted for us in Jonah chapter 3. There are all these hints and it all come together. So come with me to Exodus chapter 32. This is the second book of your Bible. We're going full Sherlock. Never go full Sherlock. Exodus 32, uh, God has just, like, like God rescued Jonah out of the belly of the fish, out of the ocean, God has just rescued Israel out of Egypt from slavery, and Moses has been up Mount Sinai speaking with God. Chapter 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. And so all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Now naturally, God, who's just rescued this people from death, from slavery... And now they've turned away, straight away. God is angry with them. And he says to Moses in verse 10, leave me alone so that my anger can burn with them. I'm going to destroy them, going to wipe them out. Moses pleads with the Lord and says, no, please relent. And so, verse 14, uh, Moses said, turn from your fierce anger, relent, don't bring disaster. And verse 14, then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Now, let me read for you Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had planned. See that? The author of Jonah picks up what was going on in Exodus chapter 32 and he brings it in here, almost word for word. But there's even more to be found. So Exodus 32, turn over the page to chapter 34. Because after God forgave Israel for their idolatry, we learn why he's done it. We learn God's name, which shows why he would forgive. So listen to chapter 34, verse 6. Hear God's name here. He, God, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Does that sound familiar? Jonah chapter 4, God's forgiven the Ninevites and Jonah's angry about it. And Jonah says, this is why I went to Tarshish. This is what I tried to put off. Let me read it to you. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love a God who relents from sending calamity. Do you see that? Exodus 32, the worshipping of the golden calf. Exodus 34, it's, it's that God is a gracious and compassionate God who relents, he's slow to anger. The author of Jonah pulls these in here for us, he recalls them, it's probably Jonah himself. And so what's going on? What's with all these connections? The worshipping of the golden calf, God's turning from his anger, the name of God, the gracious and compassionate one. Why is Jonah quoting these verses? It's the historical context. What's going on for Israel? They were stuck in the same sins that they'd always been stuck in right from the beginning of their history. Their birth, Israel's birth, is out of the clutches of slavery. They existed in the worst of the worst situations and God showed incredible compassion and grace towards them. And straight away, they abandon him and they make a cow and they go, this will be our God. 
Now, Israel did that at their start, but hundreds of years later, in Jonah's time, they're exactly where they were at the beginning. So what's God saying to, Jonah, to Israel in Jonah 3? He's saying, repent. Look at the Ninevites. Look at them, the worst of the worst, and they're repenting at my word. They're obeying, they're turning. Be like the Ninevites. <laughs> Listen to my word, come back to me. Stop worshipping idols. I'm your creator. I'm the God of heaven who's given you life and breath and everything else. You're my special people. I've shown you so much love and you live for golden cows. God could bring about repentance in the worst of the worst, but he needs to do it in those who should have been the best of the best. And so he's saying, repent, repent, turn back, Israel. And so what's the picture that we get of humanity from this passage? Well, on the one hand, you've got Nineveh, the the most brutal and violent of all people. But then there's Israel, who of all people should have been acceptable to God, should have been good and right before him. And yet they're in the same position. They needed to repent too. Perhaps they weren't as brutal and wicked as Nineveh, but their hearts were just as far from God. Because our hearts are idol factories. We, we're so bent in on ourselves, we naturally turn away from God and look for anything else to live for. Because that's the human condition. And so when God looks at humanity, he sees his creatures, who he created to be good, who he created good, now turned away from his love. People who are basically, at heart, bad. Not necessarily wicked murderers, though some of us are, but people who've turned away, people whose hearts are not there. Maybe we're still nice people, but we've, we've not worshipped and loved our Creator as we were meant to do. In the Gospels, a man comes to Jesus and he says, Good teacher, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now Jesus is God. But no one is good. Why is no one good? Because we've not given our creator the honour he deserves. Whether you're a violent, wicked Ninevite or you're just an apathetic, middle-class Aussie who's just going about their life We worship and we praise and we live for, well, pretty much anything other than God, apart from his work in us. And praise God, he works in us. The Westminster Catechism says, the chief end of mankind is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The chief purpose, the chief end of us is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why we exist. And what a glorious thing to exist for. Anything else is just so far short of that. And look how far short we've fallen. This uh, this reality that we are God's creatures and we haven't lived for Him, this is something that deeply changed me when I became a Christian. And it's, it's been this ongoing deep conviction to understand that I'm, what I am is a creature of a creator God who made me for a reason. That has, um, has completely shaped my life ever since. I exist for a reason. It's to glorify and enjoy God. And the Bible showed me that my life is not about me. My life is about God. But I'd live my entire life just just not thinking about God, just ignoring Him. I was, a, I was a decent enough guy, I wasn't a Ninevite, but I just ignored God, I had no thought for Him. And so I was rightly headed for judgment. And like God told Nineveh, 40 more days and you will be overthrown, God has told us, Acts chapter 17, that He has set a day in the future where He would judge the world by the man He's appointed. Jesus Christ, and he's given proof that he's done that and that he will do that 
by raising him from the dead. That's the diagnosis. We need God's compassion. We need God's mercy and grace to us. And that's the cure. Clearly before us in Jonah 3. Where God has such mercy and grace and compassion upon the worst of the worst. And his people Israel, because he writes this book and puts it before them. And he's going to write another one too, to tell them the same thing. Micah, he's going to tell them another one too. The next book, Nahum, he's going to write another one, Habakkuk. God just keeps pleading with his people. Come back to me. Come back. And so what's the cure? How do we get right before this God on that day when we have to stand before him and give an account? It's the grace and compassion of that God secured for us in the Lord Jesus. The one who truly was the only good man, who perfectly obeyed God in everything, who honoured God above else, who loved his neighbours to the point that he endured the, the anger of God that should have been on them. He endured that himself so that those of us like me who aren't good can be free, can be right before God. And so we receive this grace and this forgiveness of God by doing what the Ninevites did, by hearing the news and believing God. We believe God's word to us and we repent. We turn from our sin. We believe the word that says, look to Jesus as a saviour. He's died so that you might be saved. Such is God's love for you. And we, we turn from our sin. We turn from living for idols, whatever they might be, career, family, whatever. And we live now to glorify and enjoy God forever. Falling and stumbling and failing and looking back at idols, and, but we keep pressing ahead to live for our great creator God who's been so compassionate toward us. And so have you believed God's word? Have you looked to Jesus as your saviour? Have you turned from your sin and said, God, help me to live for you now. Our God is a gracious and compassionate one, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And by his mighty power, he can turn even the hardest of hearts back to us. Would you turn back to him and know that he's done that in you if you do? And if you've not repented, why not do it tonight? Do it now while there's still time. We don't know how long we're going to have in this life. There is a day coming where you will have to give an account of your life. Much better to say, stand before God and say, God, Jesus took my sin. He took your anger. Then have to fess up yourself and say, yeah, I ignored you. Much better to have Jesus stand in your place. And if you have turned back to God, rejoice. Rejoice in the grace of God toward you. He's slow to anger and his love is enduring. Look how gracious our God's been to us. And keep up your efforts to see others one. To see more people in this building. To see more young people all over the Central Coast gathered here so that they might be right with God, so that they might not waste their lives following idols, so that they might glorify and enjoy God forever. Keep up your efforts to share the good news with others. Uh, God is a God who delights to forgive. And so we just keep at it. Keep asking the Summer Series question. Serving in Summerfest. Serving in... God will use our efforts. Keep giving. I'm going to invite the band to come up, but I want to tell you a quick little story. So band, come up and, and we'll sing in a moment. But uh, a, few, uh, a few of you will, will know Rick Warner. Rick, uh, did, he, he grew up here, did MTS here, now he's serving in a church down in Melbourne, uh, and we did MTS together. But uh, a few years before I became a Christian here in, at EV Night, it was 2008 I first came along, um, so Todd beat me by a couple of years, but, but a couple of years before I came along to EV Night, I met Rick Warner randomly. Uh, we were both working, doing some World Vision work, and we had a meeting. And, uh, and at the meeting, Rick said, hey, Dan, why don't you come along to church? And my response was, no. Nah. 
not interested. And kind of had a little chuckle to myself that there's this guy who thinks going to church is cool. Now, I thought I was fine. I thought I was a good bloke. I thought my life, you know, I was, I don't know, I was just living. I wasn't really thinking about God. But that's exactly what's so terrible and wrong. I just, I wasn't even thinking about my God, the one who was, I was breathing as I was talking to Rick and God's keeping me alive and I'm not even thinking of my God. And three years later, something like that, I don't know what was different, but God just decided, now's the time, you're mine, Dan, and I'm bringing you in. And by his great power, he worked in me by his spirit and he brought me along. I'd maybe just someone who was a bit nicer than Rick invited me, I don't know. Is that possible? Um, And God decided, you're mine. I'm going to save you. And he showed me that I'm his creature. He's my creator. And so he brought me to repentance. And God's doing, that's what he's doing. That's why time exists now. That's what we got to live our lives doing. Telling more and more people. Because our God is a gracious and compassionate God. He delights to forgive. He's working in the world to forgive. And so let's praise him for that. And let's get busy doing anything we can to see that happen more and more, yeah? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks that you are a gracious and compassionate God and we ask that you keep saving more and more people and help us to be involved and help us to live lives that honour and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.